I'm with Richard Woods. He's a catamaran designer and a sailor. And we're talking about different elements of boat design that you might not necessarily think of when you're looking for a boat for yourself. But um, he's cluing us into some of the things that designers think about um, when they're designing boats. Um, so it's a few extra hints for you on your search. But one of the topics that we um, we're going to talk about are bows, bow shape, whether they're vertical, whether they're bluff. And I think I'm going to get him to define that a little bit so we know what we're talking about. And then he'll give us some of his thoughts. So go ahead, Richard. Can you define what a vertical bow is? <laughs> yeah, vertical bow is uh, really evident. It's, it is where the water line and the, 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 and the bow at the uh, deck line um, in the same position so that the front of the boat is up and down and then you would have a conventional bow would be a raked bow and a um, just in the last few years there's been a trend towards reverse bow um, or a ram bow um, I think of icebreakers when I think of a reverse bow yeah. not yeah. quite well, but where the water line, anyway, it's where the, the, the boat is in the water at the water line is further forward than it is at the deck. Um, so um, we need, uh, and it's, it's one of those things where you can understand um, that if you've got a racing boat um, with a length limit, which is at the moment 60 feet, whether it's a monohull or multi-hull really, um, you build to that that boat to that length because it's going to be a faster boat. Um, but it's a racing boat. And what we're talking about are cruising boats. And the cruising boat has got to sail well, but it's not the only thing that a, a cruising boat has to do. It's got to be a liverboard boat and it's got to be sailed by people who aren't professional sailors. It's got to be sailed in all weathers. It's got to come into port in all weathers. There's uh, 30 people sailing 60 foot foiling monohulls around the world at the moment. And they can do it single-handed until they get into port. And then that's when they'll need a big shore crew. But you, as a cruising boat, you don't have a big shore. <laughs> Sadly, no. Of you, or maybe four of you to come alongside. I remember um, years ago, crossing the Bay of Biscay, trying to beat a gale and coming into North Spain. And we just managed it. But we came in in driving rain, 40 knots of wind maybe, um, into a strange harbour at two o'clock in the morning and tying up to a key wall <laughs> and that's pretty i wouldn't say it's normal because it would put everyone off but it's something that you've got to expect to do and i'm sure you've done the same sort of thing. yeah i have a landing in south but, africa that i clearly recall um, yeah everyone who's done any sailing at all has these I don't want to do that again. <laughs> yes, it makes the open ocean seem very appealing. So like and those were one of the things I remember. Another one was when we actually launched our Scooter 28, brand new boat, launched it and from the travel hoist and motored it across 20 yards to the dock. And I hit the dock quite hard because I had no idea how long the boat was because I'd only just launched it or how it would react or anything like that. And our boat had a nicely raked bow, as okay. did the one going into this harbour in Spain. And what we were able to do in both cases was stand right at the bow and fend off. And oh, the boat, of course. The boat was... You know, we were in front of the boat in effect. Um, and we had a nice wide deck that we could safely stand on. And in fact, what I usually do on my designs is the deck's nice and wide. I put the pulpit back 
a couple of feet so that you can actually stand in, got a safe standing area in front of the pulpit so that when you're coming alongside um, and going to get down onto the pontoon um, or onto a wall, um, you're not having to climb over the lifelines as well. And yet right. you're still safe. You can stand, you've got a little area you can stand on in front of yes. you. Well, that and makes me appreciate the ARPA much more. I, I, I'm very aware of those now that you're talking about it, that it was a very good flat work area and we definitely fended off from the bows on different occasions and, different and occasions, knew that the yeah. boat was a long way in and behind. But well, and then you've got to do it twice because you're on a catamaran, so you've got two bows. Mm -hmm. On a monohull, you've just got the one bow to fend off. But you might be on the, normally, say, the starboard side coming, and you're coming in. Mm -hmm. You can't really see the port side at all, and you can't see the port bow from the helm. Right. Often you can't see the port bow from the helm. So the chances of hitting something with the bows is quite high. So this is boats with an overhanging bow. Now imagine you have a vertical bow mm -hmm. coming in. There's two factors there. One is that you're more likely to hit anywhere down the length of the bow, rather than just at the top, which is maybe four feet above the waterline. Um, you could hit and damage anywhere down the bow. But the other factor is that the boat is much narrower. It's a three-dimensional shape. You can't just mm -hmm. say, I've got, let me make the bow vertical. Because if you make the bow vertical from a raked bow, that means either you've shortened the boat and you have basically a transom of the bow, or you have to pull the deck right in. And if you pull the deck right in, you're not going to be able to stand in front of the, uh, certainly not going to be able to stand in front of the pulpit, like I just said that we would do. And even the back near the, the mooring cleats is going to be very narrow. So that makes it all quite a bit dangerous, especially if you're older and less agile. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes it, very stressful coming alongside. We all know the stories of you know, the sort of the time when you get divorced is because <laughs> you're picking up more. Right, right. Um, and, and part of that is because it's, you feel unsafe on the boat. Right. At the yeah. end. Um, and the safer you can feel, the less stress you get. Um, so that's another factor. And then imagine the ram bow <laughs> where what you hit, you, you're coming into a wall or a dock and you cannot reach because the first thing that hits is the boat. Right. You, know, you can't fend off. But not only that, but what you're hitting is below the water line. So you hit it bad enough, you have a hole in your boat below the waterline. Hmm. Instead of a bang on the top, which you could have fended off, you actually have a hole. So that's a major deal. Which would you rather have? A boat that was potentially slightly faster or a boat that could potentially have a hole in it? Yes, now that's... And that's... it's not just... Again, going back to this uh, Bond Day race around the world, they've had about 15 people retire but half of them have retired because they've hit things that were floating in the water. And that, unfortunately, is a very common thing to do. And you know, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, with all the deadheads and flotsam and all the logs, oh, you're yes. always yeah, it's scary. Sailing at night is really, really scary. And most people don't do it, do they? Because yeah. of what they might hit. Um, um, Someone who has sailed at night quite a lot, raced it like around Vancouver Island and in the race to Alaska and things, and the, the off the west coast of Vancouver Island, hitting something at one o'clock in the morning with 
With yeah, well, that's the whole world that. now, too. We we hit a number of different things and um, definitely had gratitude for our false vows that were designed on our boat. Um, managed to carve into one of those without realizing we had at one point. Um, I think on the way to uh, Sri Lanka, we hit something very significant. So talk about what else in vows we're looking for then, because, um, you know, we... Uh, probably hit our bows three or four times on things in a very significant way. So hearing you talk about the different shapes of bows makes me realize how much I appreciate ours in retrospect. But um, what else should we be looking for in that part of the hull? Well, the other thing actually um, is the netting beam itself. Um, because embarrassingly, I have dented one netting beam um, by hitting a piling coming into a coming into a marina in the dark <laughs> seeing it um, and I had another one I know where someone actually put a hole in in the netting beam and then very dramatically and it was obviously the skipper's fault um, going down the ICW and he hit a navigation boy and broke <sighs> broke the beam Oops. Um, and he was very lucky that the mast didn't come down because obviously when you break the beam, you're probably going to lose the four stairs. Well. Right, yeah. Um, and I think he, because it had an inner four stair, he kept the mast up. Um, so one of the things to think about is what happens if I do damage that beam? Can I change it? Will the mast fall down if it breaks? Um, and I try and design boats where the bridle and the four stay are sort of one unit and the beam stops the sagging rather than taking the whole weight. Right. I'm not quite sure what you did with yours in the end, how you changed We and We changed to an I-beam, I believe, an aluminum I-beam, uh, because I think you know that we had a boat break away in a storm um, ahead of us and came down. It was a great big, heavy, heavy monohull. And it came down on our beams and on our bows early on in ownership. So that um, that was the first time we discovered how well designed and built the boat had been. <laughs> it, it, it got through that um, fairly unscathed. We did a few changes. Yeah, but, no, um, that is actually another thing. I, I've had a, I wasn't actually on board, but we had we on a on a mooring and another boat monohull broke loose and ended up across the bows and banging into us and that's again that's something to consider compared to a monohull because on a monohull it wouldn't happen no it would, it would just go by around. yeah More. um and that's happened and i know other people have had exactly the same problem when they've been in a tidal anchorage a boat has broken loose up ahead upstream and come down sideways and got completely jammed which you can't you basically can't get it off <laughs> no not no, to look no way, tide or wind changes direction it's you're all yeah, tangled yeah, together well, yeah I mean, you've got to get the harbour master to come and pull them off um and so the bows of the boat is the front of the car isn't it that uh, the near side wing is what gets hit the most yeah um, the bows get the most damage and um, the other thing uh, on the same thing is that when you've got damage what's going to happen and I always design boats with a watertight bulkhead inside and I think you just mentioned that yes yeah um, so that if the bow has got a hole in it the water doesn't come into the boat um, and I also like to have watertight compartments under the sail lockers so uh it's got to be well i always say it's twice as unsinkable as the titanic <laughs> i like that <laughs> um that you've got to have a very big hole um to have a problem and in fact just thinking of it just now about 30 years ago one of my 30 foot boats was built in it was built in south africa that dragged ashore um a Sagita, uh, and went on the rocks and 
one keel was completely ripped off, but it had interior trays and watertight compartments. And they got the boat home without assistance, 20 miles motoring with the one hull was awash. Wow. But no water got into the boat, even though it was missing the keel. Huh. So that's another uh, thing. There's a multi house traditionally, people said, oh, they're unsinkable. But Oh, you can and sink them. Not, we anyway. definitely saw people manage to sink them, but <laughs> you have to work a little harder, I guess. Yeah, so that's the uh, fact that a lot of Maldi house now are, are sinkable must make you worry even more about how easy is it going to damage things if I hit things. Yeah. As we we're saying, it's going to be basically probably from the from the bows and what would I do about it and how much what impact <laughs> what impact would the impact have yes. on, on my survivability that's that seems like a really good place to stop this discussion that's really interesting though because I was thinking when we first talked about bows the shape I, I hadn't realized how much there was that going on there in the shape that I hadn't ever thought about, does that make sense? Um, but yeah, thank you for letting me know about all the good features that were in my boat that I got to appreciate without really understanding the design thought behind them. So another good conversation, Richard. Yeah, well, that was good. Yeah. All right, well, cool. Till well, thank time. you for all your time until next time. And next time I'll start my coffee a little earlier. <laughs>